Hi everyone. We're going to give people a few minutes to come in as people are trickling in. I see a question in the chat. Is this the right place to be? This is the right place to be for nothing begins with us celebrating Lansing Poets Laureate. People have been coming into the room, the webinar pretty quickly. It's so just giving it a, a few more moments. All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Russell. I'm the director of the, oh, I have a question in the chat. Um, yes, I am the only one on the screen at this moment and you will see everyone else shortly. So yes, you're seeing correctly. I'm Lauren Russell. I'm the director of the RCAH Center for Poetry at Michigan State University. Um, really excited for this event. Welcome to Nothing Begins With Us, celebrating Lansing's Poets Laureate with Dennis Heinrichsen and Laura Apel, both fantastic poets and ambassadors for poetry. Like the Poet Laureate Project itself, this event is a true collaboration. We at the Center for Poetry are excited to co-present this event with the Lansing Poetry Club. And we'd also like to thank our friends at LEAP Lansing Economic Area Partnership, who were also such a big part of making the Poet Laureate program possible. For information about future Center for Poetry events, please subscribe to our newsletter or follow us on social media. And for information about future Lansing Poetry Club events, uh, you can also follow them on Facebook. Many, many thank yous. Um, just very quickly, thank you to Lori Hollinger, our brilliant assistant director who did so much work behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, and to our interns, especially Rachel Iyer, Ksenia Luki, Celeste Rubino, Grace Carney for the Q&A. These are like notes, so just keep in mind. For the Q&A at the end of the evening, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, you can see it down there next to live transcript. Um, so please use that to ask questions. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can use the comments function and someone will relay it to us in this webinar. If you need closed captioning, you can click on the little icon that says live transcript on the far right at the bottom panel, um, and that will turn it on. And I believe there's going to be a brief survey following the event, so keep an eye out for that. And before I introduce our fantastic, wonderful collaborator, Lansing Poetry Club President, Rulaine Stokes, I will give the land acknowledgement, as is the tradition here at Michigan State University. We collectively acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg Three Fires Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi peoples. In particular, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, 
for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Now it's my pleasure to hand the virtual mic to our collaborator, Rulaine Stokes. It has been such a pleasure and an honor to work with you. Rulaine is president of the Lansing Poetry Club and we'll be talking a little bit about the Lansing Poet Laureate Program and introducing the poets. Rulaine Stokes. Rulaine, you're muted. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> you know, Zoom is a humbling, humbling experience. Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. On behalf of the Lansing Poetry Club, the RCAH Center for Poetry at Michigan State University, and the Lansing Economic Area Poet Partnership, known as LEAP, I'm really happy to announce that we're looking for a third poet laureate to engage our community in the literary arts. The deadline for applications is Monday, February 7th, 2022 at 5 p.m. Applicants must be 18 years or older and live in Ingham, Clinton, or Eaton County. This is a two-year appointment with a stipend of $2,000 per year provided by LEAP. A full description of the requirements, the guidelines, the timeline, and also the application can be found on the LEAP website. Lori, if you could put that up in the chat, that would be wonderful. Uh, the address is for LEAP is peerlancing.com. You can find the links on their placemaking page. So that's peerlancing.com pl slash placemaking. So on the placemaking page, you'll find the link to the Lansing Poet Laureate and also from there, the guidelines, the application form and the FAQ sheet. In January, we're gonna offer a number of informational workshops, both online and in person. But do, if you're thinking, if you have an inkling that you might be interested in being the Poet Laureate, or if you know somebody, you can think of somebody who you think would be a great laureate, please check out the guidelines now and start thinking about what might be possible. And tonight, we're sponsoring a visit with Lansing's two stellar poets laureate, Laura Apol and Dennis Heinrichsen. They will share their experience as laureates and read selections from their poetry. Afterwards, as Lauren mentioned, there will be a Q&A session. Laura A. Paul served as Lansing Poet Laureate from 2019 to, 20, to this spring 2021. She followed Dennis, who served as Lansing's first Poet Laureate from 2017 to 2019. Together, their work has increased public awareness of poetry as an art form, it's increased opportunities for poets and poetry lovers throughout this mid-Michigan region. And using poetry as a vehicle, as a medium, it's increased our sense of connection with the places where we live and work. Laura's poetry is remarkable for its passion and its precision, its grace and rare courage. She's the author of several chapbooks and books of poetry, including Falling into Grace, also Crossing the Ladder of Sun, which won the Oklahoma Book Award for Poetry. One of my favorites is Requiem Rwanda, which was finalist for the Lascaux Prize in Poetry and was based on her work using writing to facilitate healing among survivors of the genocide. Another of her books, was nothing but the blood, the winner of the Oklahoma Book Award, and also the silver medal for the Independent Publisher Awards for Poetry. Uh, her writing week workshops for healing are truly remarkable. And she recently published the book, 
poetry, poetic inquiry in Rwanda, engaging with the lives of others. And this book focuses on arts-based inquiry, international collab collaboration, and the therapeutic uses of writing in response to trauma. Her newest poetry collection, A Fine Yellow Dust, was released in August 2021. She's a terrific writing teacher, and I speak from personal experience, and her workshops have sustained poets in mid-Michigan and in other countries and inspired us to write during a particularly difficult time. Let's give a big Zoom welcome to Laura Apol. Wow, thanks so much, um, Rulaine, for that introduction. So let me start my timer here so that I'm sure I'm on track. And, and thank you, Lori and Lauren, for all the work you've put into this um, uh, two nights in a row. So uh, it's an honor to be here again with Dennis and uh, to be representing the role of Poet Laureate in, Mich in Mid Michigan in the Lansing area. Um, I've really sort of constructed the things that I want to talk about as the story of the time I spent as the Poet Laureate. And um, we've heard from Elaine some of what the goals are for having a Poet Laureate. Um, but I wanted to just share um, what has appeared in other places to talk about this role. The role of the Poet Laureate is to engage the Tri-County region, and that's Clinton, Eaton, and Ingham counties, in the literary arts to pr promote poetry as an art form, to expand access to the literary arts, to connect the community to poetry, and to showcase poetry as a literary voice that contributes to a greater sense of place. And that notion of place is really important in, um, in the things that the Poet Laureate is called to do. Um, Bob Trezise, the president and CEO of LEAP says, the appointment of a Poet Laureate is both symbolic and tangible, an element that speaks to the value this region places on embedding arts and cultural experiences into daily life and most certainly an amenity that draws and keeps talent in the region. And as you heard Lauren refer to it, the, Lan the Lansing Poet Laureate serves as an ambassador for poetry um, within the region. So those, that's sort of the backdrop against which I'm gonna tell the story of my time as the Poet Laureate. Um, that was the charge I was given and I embarked on my tenure with enthusiasm. In the early months, I conducted dozens of workshops and readings, most of them intimate, a group of a dozen at a writing workshop or a group of 20 to 30 at a reading. I met with stakeholders, wrote articles, did interviews and podcasts, learned social media, hmm, kind of, visited teachers and set in motion ideas for the placemaking project that I intended to leave behind as a record of my laureate time. That's one of the things the laureate has to do is leave behind um, a footprint, a placemaking project. So I was out and running on all of that and then the pandemic arrived. It was March and I was 10 months into my term. The readings and workshops I had on my upcoming schedule were canceled. My placemaking project was upended. The people around me were reeling and I was reeling too. In those early days, it became immediately evident that the ways we could have and we could keep poetry in our lives were going to need to change immediately. April was National Poetry Month and I had numerous things lined up one by one, each dropped away. We were mere weeks into the, pan the panic of COVID and life as we knew it had without warning screeched to a stop. We were stunned and numb and utterly alone. It was clear that we needed poems and we needed each other. And so instead of continuing to pursue my project of poetry of place, which had now become impossible, I shifted into working on a project I called Poetry in Place. We were stuck where we were, right? So we were having poetry in 
place. I sent out a request for local poets and poets who had once been local to create a video of themselves reading a poem, one of their own or by another poet, and then to submit it to me to be posted on the Lansing Poet Laureate Facebook site. I posted a poem each day beginning on April 1 and ending a few days into May. We had a, a couple of extras, so we went on even though the month was over. I created the first few videos myself while we all got organized, who, when, how, what. The Poetry in Place project got us poemed through that first horrible month of transitions. We saw and heard one another, even from afar and through a screen. There are some terrific poems that were viewed by many hundreds of readers from near and far, no longer groups of 12 or 20, these were hundreds. A record of those readings can be found on the Lansing Poet Laureate Facebook page and the LEAP website page for the Lansing Poet Laureate. And Lauren's gonna post the um, LEAP website page because that might be a little harder for you to find if you want to go looking. In the months that followed that April, we all made huge changes. The role of Poet Laureate made huge changes as well. At first, I needed to learn, we all needed to learn new technologies for posting poems on Facebook, for making recordings, for conducting Zoom readings and workshops. We needed to know when to mute and when to unmute. Um, and that just uh, kicked me off my talk. Hang on. We, <laughs> speaking of technology, we needed to know when to mute and when to unmute. We needed to learn how to listen and speak in new ways. We needed to figure out how to support one another through a screen, with cameras on or off, with chats active or not. And with each month, we became better at it, more skilled at the technologies, but also more patient with each other and ourselves, more settled, less upended by disappointment and fear and uncertainty. We were also more tired, more lonely, more worn down. In those months, I ran dozens of workshops and readings attended not only by people from mid-Michigan, but from across the country and even from around the world. I wrote articles and I did a lot of thinking about the role of writing when it comes to trauma, ways that writing can help people navigate difficult times like last night's workshop and perhaps even to begin to heal. I had two books come out that were about those very things. Um, this one, Poetry, Poetic Inquiry in Rwanda, Engaging with the Lives of Others, and then um, this newest one, A Fine Yellow Dust. And both of those are um, books that in very different ways talk about writing and healing. When for our own healing, after months of disinfecting groceries before taking them in and leaving our mail in the garage for 48 hours, it seemed we needed a break, some sort of a retreat, a bit of poetic self-care. In July, we had a month long retreat at home, meeting on Mondays for some thinking about writing and an invitation and Sundays for a read around to share what we'd produced. At the end of the month, we had conferences about our poems and possible revisions, and we concluded with a public online reading. There were other readings and other workshops, several each month that served to keep us connected to poems and to one another, as well as to the moment in which we live and write. In the last year and a half, we have brought to one another poems about the pandemic, about the Black Lives Matter movement, about anti-Asian racism, political upheaval, profound personal loss. We needed to read them. We needed to hear them. We needed to speak them. Most of all, we needed to write them. Last November, we raised more than $1,000 for the Lansing Community Garden during Everybody Shares. In spring, we talked together about how to publish, where, when, in order to get our words out to the world. Month after month, we brought our own coffee or tea or wine to our computers and did our best to be together. And we were together. It was an honor for me to be part of the Lansing Poetry community during this time because I believe 
fully and full heartedly that in these months and in the foreseeable future as well, we have need of poetry. We were, we are isolated, lonely, confused and frightened, tired. We have needed to pay attention to the way, in the way poetry pays attention to ourselves, each other, the world. We need to keep doing it. As the poet laureate during the pandemic, my charge was to support the community in writing. I wanted individuals, both those who considered themselves to be poets and those who did not or did not yet, I wanted those individuals to write in order to feel, in order to create community. Putting our experiences into words has been a way for us to be present to ourselves and to each other. I've also wanted writers to write in order to document this time, not only in our own lives, but as a time in history, to create a record in poems of what it has felt like to make the sudden shift to the unknown with no map, to learn to see and feel, resist and embrace, touch and breathe in new ways, to engage in protest and upheaval, to notice what has changed and what has stayed the same to attend to our own lives, whatever those lives have lost or held. Brendan Kennelly writes, poetry is above all a singing art of natural and magical connection because though it is born out of one person's solitude, it has the ability to reach out and touch in a humane and warmly illuminated way, the solitude, even the loneliness of others. That is why to me, poetry is one of the most vital treasures that humanity possesses. It is a bridge between separated souls. And the poet Edward Hirsch writes, poetry rises out of one solitude to meet another in recognition and connection. It companions us. As the outgoing poet laureate looking back, I have to say that that I think that's what poetry has done for many people in these many months. It became a bridge, it comforted us, it inspired and energized us, it created community. Ultimately, it has made us better companions of one another. Vera Sackville West has written, it is necessary to write if the days are not to slip emptily by. How else indeed to clap the net over the butterfly of the moment? It is easy in a pandemic to feel days slipping emptily by, but the poets with whom I've spent my time as poet laureate, and you're looking at some of them right now um, on this screen, have found ways to capture the moment and to leave a record of a particular time in history with their words. Their poems, their resilience, their faces on Zoom screens, they tell a story. They have companioned me. We companion one another. So what does it mean to be the Poet Laureate? How can I summarize what I did and what I learned? What advice would I give? It's alive and changing, adapting to the moment and the needs of the moment, and don't I know it? Certainly it requires poetic skill, reading, writing, teaching, but it also requires heart. It's an honor and a responsibility. It begins by taking one path, but it winds up somewhere else. It allows for teaching to be sure, mostly it allows for learning. It allowed me to join with other voices of poets and lovers of poetry in the mid Michigan area, past, present, future. Here's the poem that was my contribution to the program that accompanied the handing of the Laurel event that, um, that took place when I became the Poet Laureate. It's the title of this event as well, Nothing Begins With Us. It speaks to the ways poetry begins before us, continues after us. It ushered me into this role. Little did I know then what the two years would hold. Nothing begins with us, not this story or any other. Andromeda does not slow her dizzying spin, nor does a field of wheat wait. We catch our plane in flight, Below us, time fades like a prim border of pines, while the sky opens wide as God's blue eye. We have far to go, navigating between stars that appear only after dark. 
The secret names we were given at birth are cradled in our curved hands. It is a magic world now, and we are at the center, our own lives the map, our words the edge of a knife. We are just beginning to hone. So that's my story of uh, the two years that I spent as the Poet Laureate. As you can tell, there's a real theme to it. Um, I spent most of my time um, figuring out how to navigate a lot of technology and a lot of new environments and ways of going forward. Um, not what I expected, but certainly something that I was um, really um, privilege to be part of and part of a community that came along so thoroughly um, as we all tried to forge a new way of being poets and lovers of poetry together. Um, so what I've chosen to read um, during this reading time is not from um, any of the other things that, that I've published or written, but I just wanna re read some of my pandemic poems. Uh, mostly because I think everyone has pandemic poems. So I don't really read them very often because it feels like, oh, the world doesn't need another pandemic poem, does it? But um, in light of my story of being the poet laureate during a pandemic, I decided that um, this was a good opportunity to share some of these poems. And I haven't exactly put them in the order in which they were written. Um, you'll notice that they do kind of move with the season and um, are very, very located in place. How could they not be? Um, so, so you'll see a lot of images that recur, mostly because if you're staying at home, you see the same things um, out your windows and in your yard over and over. Uh, so the, the first poem that I wrote during the pandemic was actually, I felt a little hopeful that um, this was a brief hiatus and that we were having a chance to kind of slow down and, um, and, and catch our breath. So um, this has the head note from Pablo Neruda's poem, which was going around widely at the time. Um, the poem is called Keeping Quiet, the Neruda poem is. Um, and it says, if we for once could do nothing, perhaps a huge silence might interrupt this sadness of never understanding ourselves. My poem is called Ode to the Heron. Someone should tell the trees we are sheltered in place. Each day they nudge further toward green, toward tenuous blossom in the reckless spring wind. Someone should tell the heron and the light on the heron. Someone should tell the wild hyacinth, the beaded grace of the willow. This is a year for unfettered beauty. Do not hold back. Consider the lilies. Consider the robin, the redbud, and magnolia. Consider the vole and the feral cat and the fox poised at the verge. Praise the immovable rock in the river, the bones of the fallen fir. Bless the iridescent blue beetle. Step gently and study the heron. She flies where she will, head forward, full on, wings herself in reverse to slow, stop, then settle, serene and unblinking in the fast moving current. But then it stopped being quite as fun to be home and quiet. Um, this is a poem called Is Touch. Tonight I'm thinking of those things I didn't know I should love crickets, dragonflies, the burr of owls on nights I can't sleep, the turtle on the lane, a red-eared slider that set the dog barking, a pair of milk snakes twined in the rock garden, wildflowers that are weeds and weeds that are wildflowers, the forever burrowing of moles and the chipmunk the mama cat brought to her young where their instincts set upon it tiny teeth and claws left only the tail. I'm thinking of a man from long ago who still knows me in my dreams. I should never have said goodbye. What I miss most is touch, followed by scarves and earrings. 
If you come for a visit, I will meet you on the drive. It's been so long. And at last I have learned to hold out my hands to say yes to what I love. And then it's Solstice 2020. Um, and this is a poem called Never the River. It begins, Solstice 2020 and over Asia, there's an annular eclipse, a bright ring of fire, corona haloing the empty circle of sun. Here, the first day of summer is a corona of sameness, more social distance, unseasonably warm, a bad day for sapling pines, a good day for crows. In a murder, they circle an imperial hawk, chase it from their trees, black cause darkening the sky, the longest day. And a boat motors my river after sunset. I see lights, hear voices across the water. Someone coughs, coughs, coughs again. What can they catch after dark and what, after all, is mine? Not the steelhead or walleye or smallmouth bass, not the tree frog or the evening bats over the reeds, not the crows fanning the last embers of day and never the river. The fishing men don't know I am listening, last color drained from the sky now, muddy smell of water and air. From here on, our days will be shorter. From here on, less light. Move on, I want to tell them, move on. The sun has gone out and the river is pushing, always pushing downstream. And then um, because my beloved um, older dog died at the start of the pandemic, I did indeed have a pandemic puppy before I knew it was cool and important to have a pandemic puppy. Um, so, so I was involved in um, puppy raising um, during the pandemic. Um, I feel like I still am, even though she's a year and a half old now. Uh, but this poem is called Quarantine Fatigue, and the puppy shows up prominently here. Quarantine Fatigue. I can't see what the puppy is carrying as she returns to the house, but I do note how proudly she is prancing along the walk how gently she pads along on her enormous puppy feet. I think then that she is growing into such a good dog. She is a creature of sticks and stones deposited on the deck where she learns the world with her tongue and teeth and jaws. So as she turns to face me, I am not surprised when something falls from her open mouth. From this distance, I can see it as small and round no clatter of black walnut or green apple, but a soft dropping. By the time I reach her, the treasure is hidden once more. Even the offer of a treat in trade is of little interest until I find something she finds worth swapping for and she leaves it. A mole, pink feet, pink nose, tiny and wet and dead. The mama cat is teaching her kittens to hunt. So this is surely someone else's prize, kitten, cat. There was a time when I would have stopped, did stop the cat from killing, intervened. I am tired of loss. I am more tired of preventing loss, imagining I can keep from happening what is bound to be. Geese fly overhead and the puppy is distracted by wings. I put her in the house, Put the dead mole back in the grass where whatever will be, will be. Why I hate living alone in a pandemic. It is that kind of day, midsummer hot and humid. Mornings, I open the house to the damp of river, fill feeders for hummingbirds, food bowls for kittens, fresh milkweed for the caterpillars I am keeping, carry water for the black-eyed Susans, and the door, bang, 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 is tiresome. So I prop it open. It is that kind of day, and a small bird brown and innocuous, a house finch perhaps, female, 
flies through the open door onto the porch. Window glass all around and she is frantic, confused. The sky, the trees so brilliantly right there, her own wings beating wildly against, into, toward, into, against, toward what she knows, the world of oak, beech, and poplar. Hurtling from ledge to table to window to desk to window to ledge. The room is alive with her terror and I am frozen by her frenzy until I hear over the panic, not this bird, but another perched on the rail of the deck, reddish head thrown back, brimming with warble, a clarion summons repeated, 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 as if he could sing her back into the sky. I warned you, there are a lot of the same images. There are a lot of rivers in these poems, um, crossing. I cannot capture in a photo the do doe crossing the river at sunset. One step, another, another. The water touching her underside, slender legs, delicate hoofs binding the rocks and mud below. No, I cannot capture the doe. So instead, I want to be on the far side of the river when she reaches it, to stroke her soaked fur, the silk of her ears, her exquisite neck. I want to nuzzle her forehead, my face to her face, to know what she knows about river, about dusk, what to take over crossing, what to leave behind. November, dusk. A too early snow cleaves the pine, splitting the trunk, slides down the ever bending green. Always one side or the other, what we can save, what we can't. The life we expected, the life we have. A doe escapes the hunter or does not. Nearly escapes is not nearly enough. Her blood on the snow, in the snow on the ridge, it flows where it will, into, out of, over, through. This poem again has a head note. The poem is called Vigil, and the head note is by the poet Michael Pryor, who writes, love how inelegantly we leave how insistent we are to return in one form or another. Each day, a whir of white wings, I look up. Sleek neck, sleek body, perfect against the pale sky, a swan heading somewhere, heading sky where, pond where, homeward. The whir of her wings, the only sound in the silent gray. Each day I look up, the best, the only thing I can do. Two more. Uh, this one is called 10 Months Into Alone. 10 months into alone and the gibbous moon enters the room through bare trees branch shadows crossing the unslept side of the bed. I name, rename the light, Luna to lunatic, Loco to Lobo, which translates to wolf in the deepest hour of dark. I think I have made the wrong mistakes, too many, too much, too tightly, because it's so much easier not to let go. The insatiable, but what if? They say dreams reveal a state of mind, so I've stopped sharing mine, though the one where the car filled with water lingers for days. Perhaps it's simply the moon surfacing this season of loss. Last week, my father's sister died at a distance. He told me that after the call, he'd stayed at his desk playing solitaire online. The less you have, the less you have to lose. 10 months in and I am still resisting the rising sea, 
the moon-tossed bed, the yellow lupine eye. And then finally, prayer in the time of COVID. I invite a friend to dinner, roasted cauliflower, chickpeas and kale. We eat outdoors six feet apart. She is too thin. Tomorrow she will start radiation. They will tattoo markers across her breasts, a constellation more permanent than the changing sky. She tells me how one Thanksgiving, her son made a kale salad he massaged in the kitchen, kneaded to tenderness. The power of touch, she says. I say I have not been touched since March, not a brush of skin, bumped elbow, side by side, thigh. All week there has been a giant silk moth laying eggs on the screen door and back so near I could have stroked her wings. I think of the hands that create a radiologist's map, that break down the veined leaves of the greens, or worship the unblinking eyes imprinted on wings. God of the haloed virus that brings us to this, read our upturned palms, each fingerprint so singular, each so holy and so strange. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Wow, wow. I love the way your poems just invite me into that vivid, beautiful, um, dazzling, and difficult world, the world we all live in. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Rulaine. Yeah. Uh, our next poet tonight is Dennis Hendrickson. Uh, despite having only the faintest of templates for his mission as the inaugural Lansing Poet Laureate in 2017, Dennis served boldly to engage the community in the literary arts. He brought poets together, he organized readings in the Tri-County area, and he organized a public poetry contest, which resulted in the etching of poems in city sidewalks in Lansing, Charlotte, and St. John's. He has written, he has won an astounding number of awards and written a lot of books, more than I can even, uh, you know, put on into into words on this time, but let me give you uh, a quick summary. His most recent book is Schema Geometrica, which is winner of the Wishing Jewel Prize from Green Linden Press. And I realize that all my life, I will long to receive the Wishing Jewel Prize. It sounds utterly desirable. His previous work includes uh, Queen Lear, a chapbook from Green Linden Press, and this is where I live. I have nowhere else to go. Winner of the 2020 Grid Poetry Prize. His other awards include the 2015 Rachel Westian Chapbook Prize, the 2014 Michael Waters Poetry Prize, the 2010 Tampa Poetry Prize, the 20, 2008 Field Poetry Prize, the 1999 Akron Poetry Prize, as well as the 2016 Third Coast Poetry Prize and the 2014 Best of the Net Award. His work can also be found in two anthologies from Michigan State University Press. One of them is Undocumented, Great Lakes Poets Laureate on Social Justice, and the other is Respect, an Anthology of Poems on Detroit music. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dennis, let me remind everybody to respond, ask questions in the chat. Um, if you notice something particularly that he's reading, just uh, put a little comment in there. A brilliant poet known for his verbal pyrotechnics, Dennis is also a fine and generous teacher of the craft. Let's give a warm welcome 
to Dennis Heinrichsen. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I think I'm on. Um, thanks so much. Um, thanks um, again to Lauren and, and Laura and Lori and the Lansing Poetry Club and Lee for making the uh, Lansing Poet Laureate Project a reality here for the uh, third, third go around. I'm so happy to be part of it. I'm so happy to be here tonight to talk about um, poetry and to share some poems with you. Um, I'm gonna, my, I had the happy, uh, lucky, uh, good fortune of being the inaugural Poet Laureate. So I was brand new and everybody wanted uh, uh, a piece of my time. And it was also pre-pandemic. So uh, I drove a lot of miles and I hugged a lot of people. Uh, so uh, it was a different kind of world. And I hope the world opens up so these kinds of things can happen again and we can take poetry out into the communities, take ourselves out into the communities. But it, I wanted to start, I have a, a sequence of photos to show you uh, to help you see what I did. But I wanted to just give you the sense of the bookends. Uh, I alluded to it last night. The first day I was Poet Laureate, I was in a classroom um, with Rulane, uh, third and fourth graders, a mixed classroom. First thing that happened was a little second grader walked by and whacked me really hard in the thigh and asked me whose grandpa I was. That was moment one in my life as a poet laureate. I was ready to bolt. But then Rulane and I went into the classroom and had this, we had this really wonderful experience where this young boy wrote his very first poem. It was April, they'd been writing all year. His teacher was a fabulous teacher. The kids were really brilliant. And he wrote this first poem. Um, and, and just went electric. Uh, he was so happy to have actually produced something. And then the strangest thing happened. I had nothing at all to do with it, but he turned and looked at me and he said, you make this happen. And it gave me so much energy um, and gave me a sense of the community and gave me that, again, that idea, that Whitman-esque idea that poetry is a way we bring people together. We break down the metaphysical barrier between self and other, and suddenly this little boy was like my boon companion. I would take him to battle with me. He was so happy um, to achieve this poem. Um, and over the two year period, I, I got to a point where that kept my energy going. Some of the stuff <laughs> took a lot of work and um, we did a lot of stuff. And whenever I got uh, a little bit burned out, I thought of that kid again, I have a video of him reading his poem. I'd look at the video and uh, he would buoy me. The omega of it was I was in Charlotte the last couple of weeks uh, with a group of young women uh, at the, uh, I believe it was a crosswalk, it's called, just doing poetry, doing poetry and healing. It wasn't, we didn't call it that. We were just trying to write poems. Uh, first time we went down there, nobody wrote a poem. <laughs> they all stayed, but nobody wrote a poem. And so we had nothing to share. And then we tried to take a photograph and everybody hit their faces. Um, the next time we went down there, they wrote poems but they didn't share. Um, one girl showed me her poem, but insisted that I not reveal anything about it to her, not say anything. So I had to read her poem. It was quite good. I wanted to throw her a lot of sugar, but she didn't want anything, so I honored that. Another young girl wanted to share her poem, but didn't want to read it, so I read. And it was full of family dysfunction, et cetera. It was a really powerful poem. And then suddenly, you again saw the power of poetry, the power of healing in the sense that everybody was basically crying in the room. Poetry had connected with all these, you know, young writers here who were having a difficult time. And I kind of felt sad that my, my tour was ending. Um, uh, Laura said last night, this, the idea of poetry and healing takes a long time, weeks, months, if you will, repeated visits. And it felt like that would have been a great place to go and really work at writing poetry and, and do the wonderful thing that poetry can do with healing. James was more, for me, a, the idea of synthesis, poetry is synthesis. So what I learned is I, I worked over my two year period was that poetry um, is this living, breathing, evolving thing that has many uses uh, and it invites everybody in. Uh, it says yes to whoever wants to join uh, that particular entity, if you will. And um, for me, it was, um, an, an amazing time because um, while I had to come up with a two-year plan as part of my application process, 
um, day one, I realized one that was a stupid plan to begin with. And I was getting so many phone calls to do this, do that, et cetera, that all I had to do for two years was say yes to people who wanted to interact with the Poet Laureate. So it was improvisation from then on for the next two years. It was a really amazing wild ride. What I wanna do is go to, uh, to share my screen and get into my photo part of my program. Let's see if I can do that, share screen. Share screen, here it is. So everyone can see that? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, this is uh, the mayor, Andy Shore, um, but I'm gonna talk about something else first. The first phone call I got was from the Arts Council. They wanted me to write a poem that would be used as a script for a film celebrating arts and culture in the three county area. I had five weeks to do it. Um, I think they had the idea that the we had a poet laureate, we could just call him up and order a poem, um, put, it, put him on commission. So um, of course I couldn't say no, I didn't want to say no, I wanted to write the poem. Uh, and I figured out a way to write the poem and um, it was put together for a, a film that was shown at the Creative Placemaking 2017. And if um, things are going smoothly on the chat part, there should be a link to that video um, in the chat if you want to take a look at it. It's a poly voiced video. It involves many, many voices, uh, celebrates uh, arts and culture in, in the three county area. And it's a really wonderful film. Um, that first week I was also poked in the ribs by Pop, Bob Trezise of Leap and said, wouldn't it be a great idea if the Poet Laureate wrote an inaugural poem for the mayor? And this was in May, the election hadn't occurred yet, but he was pretty certain that Andy Shore would win. And sure enough, he won. And sure enough, I got a phone call from the mayor's office asking me to write a poem, inaugural poem. So um, I had to, one has to say, yes, it's the mayor. Uh, I had about five weeks to write it. This was a little bit more of a difficult situation, but um, I pulled it off with the help of 10 years of being a technical writer. And then I pretended I was kind of Walt Whitman. And I thought really hard about my audience, 400 people who'd never seen a poem before. And then I kind of mapped it out and uh, began um, saying things they never, that they wouldn't disagree with, if you will. I, I wrote two really, wild statements at the beginning to um, win their hearts and minds. And then I went on into speaking, um, basically riffing off Andy Shore's white paper and converting that into a poem. So uh, the poet laureate, a priest and a rabbi presented at the inauguration of Andy Shore in 2000, what was it, 2018. Uh, and um, that was the end of my commissioned work. Uh, but. It was uh, a really wonderful way to start being Poet Laureate. In addition to those things I did, um, um, I spoke to the Rotary Club, I judged the high school slam contest for the state. I wrote articles for the Lansing State Journal. I visited classrooms um, and I kind of want to get into that right here. Here's a classroom visit. This is where we were in Okemos. And in fact, this young boy right here is the boy who wrote the poem that day. Uh, his name is James. He wrote a really beautiful four line poem um, that um, I recite every now and then. I may read it here later for you. Um, in addition to the classroom visits, I um, decided that there were so many great writers in Lansing and that being a poet laureate, it wasn't really about my poems at all or my books or me as a writer. It was really about poetry and the diversity of voices. So I had this idea of taking um, a gang of people from the Lansing area into the communities. And I called it this tra my traveling poets group. And I wanted to bring in a bunch of people. So this is the, this is the first iteration of my traveling poets with Janine Serto of MSU and Grace Karras and Masaki who were killing it at the poetry room during those first months, myself and then 
the magnificent Ravine Stokes who came along with us for a ride um, that day. This is down in Charlotte. Um, I did this also up in Grand Ledge. Uh, this is Il Isabella Mansfield reading to uh, people in Grand Ledge. And in front here is Jay Artemis Hall and uh, Rosalie Petruski who came up there with me to uh, read poetry. Also went up in St. John's with uh, Relaine again and Cruz Villarreal. Um, actually cruised a couple of times up into St. John's to kind of take all these really wonderful diverse voices that we, we, we have here in Lansing and take them into these outlying areas that when you look at the, the political map, they're, they're, they tended to be more monolithic and red um, than our blue area here. So it felt really important to power poetry to take in otherness and share those stories, share those poems in those communities seemed like a really important thing to do. Um, and uh, I wish I had done more of it. I, um, things, people kept calling me, I kept saying yes. Um, one of the things I wanted to try, um, and maybe my presentation here is a kind of uh, a little bit of a menu of possible things that other poet lawyers might want to try um, and do. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do is I wanted to try to build a critical mass down in Charlotte by running open mics down there at the Windwalker. Uh, underground gallery. So for all two years, once a month um, during the academic year from pretty much September to May, we ran an open mic down there uh, in an attempt to bring people in. It didn't quite find roots. Um, my, my goal, <laughs> naive as it is, was to try to build a self-sustaining community um, of poets down there. Um, tried that again in Eaton Rapids at Mark's place. Um, a good group of writers there, but I don't know if it's the populations or we just not enough time to get the right people. It's part of being a poet laureate, I think, is running into the finding who the 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 operators are, if you will, um, the organizers, the the people that uh, are going to bring people together, that are going to attract people within these communities and link up with them, and then let them bring that group together, say in Charlotte or Eaton Rapids or some of these other communities, St. John's. And uh, it came close a couple of times, um, but, but it, uh, it didn't, uh, um, didn't work out as I had hoped. I hope it would be more sustained. Um, and then as Relaine was talking about, we did a number of community rights in three cities, in Lansing, in um, Charlotte, and in uh, St. John's, where we had the community write poem celebrating place. Um, and there's a movie that goes along with this, and I hope it gets into the chat, uh, or it's already in the chat. Um, it's called, it's on YouTube, and it's called, I think I believe it's called Sidewalk Dreams. It's about a six minute video that shows all the etching of the uh, eight poems we did here in Lansing. We identified four areas, Rio Town, Old Town, Stadium District and the East Side. And we invited people in the three county area to, to share um, their ideas about this space, to celebrate this space. Um, we had four silos of poems. We found two judges for each one of those silos and we picked uh, eight poems and ultimately etched them in the concrete um, in these locations. Um, this one is uh, Nan Jackson's poem about the Shiawassee Street Bridge and it's over on the river trail uh, by a city market, basically looking at the Shiawassee Street Bridge. Uh, that's a view of what it looks like uh, when it's being etched. Here's my artistic rendering of it. And there is the poem and the bridge that the poem is about. So this really wonderful moment of placemaking uh, occurred there, it really occurred with all the poems. Uh, Still in the stadium district, we're in front of the baseball stadium. A former uh, usher there, Alan Harris, part of the poetry community here, um, wrote a poem called Sidewalk Dreams that became our, um, our theme song, if you will, for the sidewalk project. Um, and we etched the poem in the front there. Um, there again, the guys are putting it in the ground. Um, there it is with my Don Drysdale six-fingered mitt. And there it is in black and white with Alan Harris's hand. He came by while we were finishing it up and uh, he agreed to have a picture taken with it. Um, 
We're in Rio Town now in front of the Blue Owl coffee shop, uh, putting in a poem by Grace Karras, celebrating all the amazing energy that was happening down at the Robin Theater with the Poetry Room. Um, and another artistic rendering with my Telecaster. Um, Kitty Corner from that is a poem by Rebecca Payne, speaking to the river that is just a block away. This is in front of the uh, old gas station there that was it looked like it was going to become a Pablo's for a while, but it uh, no longer is. And there's another me trying to art it up. Um, and then we're in Old Town now. And this is a, a wonderful poem to uh, Robert Busby by uh, Therese Wood uh, in front of the Arts Council. Um, and there's another good look at the poem. And then over on the uh, Breaky Fish Ladder is a poem by Cruz Villarreal called Mi Pueblo uh, that celebrates the Latino roots of Old Town. Um, little black and white one, there's Cruz himself, the author of the poem, taking a picture of his poem. He came by while we were etching it. And there's me with my Clint Eastwood Serape and Day of the Dead mask uh, and then the poem. And then Old Town River. Uh, this is a poem by Jan Shoemaker. It's on the uh, bridge. It's on the west, southwest side of the bridge, looking east. There's another shot of the poem. And then there's me. Another shot of the poem. Uh, one of the poems, um, we in, on the east side, there was really no serviceable sidewalk there. So we had this one etched in more, it's not plexiglass. I forgot, I'm trying to think of what it was called today. I can't remember what it was called. But this is the machine. Um, I went down and, and uh, watched it happen. In fact, got, <laughs> I was put into some pretty hard labor helping him do it. Um, this is the poem being etched on a, a relatively large sheet of uh, plastic. Um, it etches the words backwards. He spray paints them. Uh, all those letters we had to pick off by hand uh, with little tweezers to free them up so you could paint them. And then you finally pull all that stuff away and there's the poem. Um, that we took to uh, the Allen Street Market and it hangs inside. Um, they're undergoing renovation now, so I don't know where it's at, but it used to be inside that area um, where they had food on Wednesday. Um, so in Lansing, we did eight poems. Uh, Charlotte raised some money and wanted to do two poems. So we have a poem in front of the Arts Center in Charlotte, and then we have one in front of Windwalker as well. Um, I could not find um, could not find a photograph of the Windwalker one, but the Windwalker one's really interesting. And it's something that Rulane and I have talked about in terms of upgrading the current poems. Uh, right now, they're not they're just etched into the sidewalk, but they can also be painted. The letters can be painted, and then it can be sealed um, to even give it more durability. And the one in front of uh, Windwalker was painted. The letters were painted black, and then it was sealed. And I had a photograph somewhere. I just couldn't find it. That really makes the poem pop. Um, uh, this is uh, Miss Marie Heard, her poems in front of the railroad station in St. John's. St. John's wanted to do it as well. And again, the Arts Council raised money. And then I went up there with the Debbie Douse from the Arts Council and, and spoke to or the city council, the mayor, et cetera, and made a, made a case for $1,000. And they, they gave us $1,000 to help uh, get three poems in the sidewalk. There's another one in front of a pavilion over there. Um, and then there's another one in front of this school um, on the um, south of the major, the major thoroughfare in St. John's. Um, and this is like one of the highlights. This is a woman I met up in St. John's who came to all the workshops and was trying to write poems um, about a son she'd lost. Um, and she became a, a really boon companion. And uh, I never told her, but she reminds me of my mother a lot. So. Um, I loved her dearly um, and still in contact with her. Um, and she wrote a really wonderful poem that, that brought back the tactile experience of being inside the building there um, when she went to either middle school there or high school there. Her name's Judy Williams. So I think, ah. 
that's uh, the run of the land in, the, in regards to the, the stuff I did. Uh, I know I drove, I kept track of my miles. I think I rode, um, I drove 2,000 miles during the two years. I was probably in Charlotte, <laughs> probably about 50 times. And I was probably in St. John about, St. John's about 30 times. Grand Ledge a bunch of times, Bath, um, south side of Lansing, um, where I'll see Rapids many times. It was, uh, it was a really wonderful, magnificent experience that I think is probably on one level really unique because I was the inaugural one and we lived in a different, easier time. Um, but what I loved again about it was taking poetry in the community and finding so many people out, so many people in these communities wanting poetry uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, for, for poetry and healing reasons, for going into the classrooms, for that synthesis reason that kids uh, I think need at that level. They, they lead such an amazing, difficult lives. How do they pull that all together? Well, a poem can pull it all, all together for them. It's a unity, it forms a unity. Um, and then, the, then the, just the placemaking idea. St. John's loves visual artists uh, and, and, and it was a little bit difficult to get poetry in there because I think poetry is perceived as a little bit dangerous because it wants to seek out difference and embrace difference. But we got up in there and we got the poems in there and they understand the idea of building this beautiful culture, making this city this really wonderful, beautiful place to live. You just don't work there, go home, get up and work again. You live in a place where there's art on the buildings, there's art. Um, um, there's a railroad trestle on there if you take that um, the uh, bike path um, towards Ovid. Uh, and now there's poetry in the streets there. So um, it was a really amazing time. I had a blast. I had amazing partners everywhere. Uh, the poetry army in Lansing was particularly strong. Rude Lane was a godsend. Lori Hollinger came through with money at a critical time. Uh, everybody helped out. And I think, you know, you, uh, the next poet laureate, uh, is gonna have a really wonderful backup team to help him or her think through uh, uh, what to do and how to connect with people. The three county area is pretty big, and, but there, there are people out there that, that um, really want to bring us in, bring the poet laureate in and, and uh, help bring poetry to, to their community. So um, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm not on the committee, the selection committee. I don't think Laura is either. Is that true? No? Um, so, you know, you guys have our emails or you can get us through Facebook, but if you have any questions about the application process or any questions about um, your plan, responding to the, the re requirements, please get in touch with us because we can help you brainstorm and give you some ideas and help draw little roadmaps for you in terms of um, what's out there in terms of cities and towns and libraries and people to contact and all that. There's a, there's a wonderful richness and, and an array of things to, to yet to be done. So um, don't hesitate to reach out. I think on my behalf, I'm saying that for Laura too. Right? You reach out for, yeah, Laura too. Please reach out. We'd love to help you guys figure this out. I, when Merlaine asked me about this idea of Poet Laureate, I, I, I didn't think it was gonna be a good idea unless we could sustain it for years, 10 years. Grand Rapids is in their third decade of having poet laureates. We're just four years in. We really need to continue to build um, you know, um, a grassroots system, a feeder system. And people, you know, and there's, there's ways that a poet laureate can help do that and mentor other people. So uh, please reach out. Um, what I'm gonna do is read some poems from my new book, Schema Geometrica. Um, oh. Um, the, the, as Relaine said, it won this really cool contest, the Wishing Jewel Prize. Um, and what was really interesting about the contest is that it was an invitation to, to break what a book of poetry could be, break what a poem could be, and try to do something different with a book. And I had started this book in about two years ago and was interested in breaking the sonnet and breaking narrative and breaking logos and in fact, breaking the way I wrote. I wanted to sound differently. I wanted a different persona. So there's a really nice synergy between what I had in mind to begin with and when this contest came out and ended up being, a, a, I won, it was a good fit, I guess. Um, 
So when I started the book, I was interested in the idea of, of uh, contagion as a, a, a key, a musical key to the book. Good contagion, music, bad contagion, <laughs> uh, um, ultimately coronavirus. But before that, I was thinking about just all the, the as a white male in America, the degrees to which I've been brainwashed by so much and trying to undo so much, male privilege, white privilege, uh, male gaze, etc. cetera. I uh, started worrying about my money, uh, what my money is doing unknown to me in the world. And I began to start thinking about my lifestyle as a member of the first world in terms of the kind of unintentional harm I do in the world. Um, wearing clothes, building sweatshops, um, 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 living in a state where the energy is 25% nuclear. Um, I worked for 10 years as a technical writer, five of those for an engineering firm. So I was really interested in just the, the waste that's created, um, the waste that's circulating that's around the Great Lakes right now. Um, what happens uh, when I turn on the lights, uh, began worrying about water. Um, how come we, we don't take care of our wastewater? Um, you know, how many of us uh, watched cold water go down the drain before the morning <laughs> shower heats up? You know, and we have friends living out in California where it's drought. It just seems like what are the connections there? So um, I wrote a bunch of poems and I wanted to crash things together. They are collaged in the spirit of Joseph Cornell's boxes, if you will. And so I wanted to crash really disparate things together. And I wanted to try, kind of, kind of try, crash three things together so that I would triangulate. Plus, that's the schema geometrica of the book. The idea being that if I have three points, three things, that I've defined an area, and that's the content. And I can find, I can get more of the world in the poem, and I can try to find connections to those things. I can find connections to my own connection to those things as I point the camera outwards. Um, so the poems are kind of wild and crazy. They try to be funny sometimes. I allowed anger, I allowed anxiety. I allowed myself to be pretty snarky sometimes, irreverent sometimes, so that there was this panoply of voices in the book. And then the other cool part was that since he wanted to push what a book could be, see if I can hold this up, I was able to ask artists to join me and present a, a graphic graphics for the book. I've got one from a, a, a comic book artist in Chicago who I know who presented this for this poem. And then I have uh, Julian Van Dyke's in this book. He has a piece in here called Funk and that goes with a poem about James Brown. So I was able to push the book in a bunch of different ways and has other kind of interactive things. There's even eight of the poems of them put to music by my good friend Tom Larder. And at some point we're going to have a QR sticker in the corner here to get to you. If you buy the book, or have a copy of the book, please get in touch with me because I'm gonna have the stickers probably in a couple of weeks. And that sticker will be uh, a way that you can just scan and then get to the, the music right away and have the book in your hand and, and follow along. So uh, that was the whole contest and that was kind of just fit perfectly for what I was doing. So let me read a few of the poems to give you a feel for what's going on in the book. Um, we talked yesterday about breathing and in and out and how it connects us to other people and and because everybody's breathing all at once. Uh, and I, I wrote one, one of, uh, I wrote a poem that started getting me thinking about that. This one's called Schema Geometrica with Rainer Maria Rilke and a Tuk Tuk and a dog. Tuk Tuk is a, uh, uh, one of those three wheeled vehicles um, you see in the third world, um, a rickshaw, a motorized rickshaw, basically. And one of the ideas, one of the lines that gets repeated in this book, which is why I kept thinking about breath, is how easily, as a member of the first world, I unintentionally do harm. I breathe indiscriminately, I kill the same. My breath, my ex exhalations are a poison. I turn on a light. I've created, I've harmed the environment in some way. I'm eating electricity. And I, and I wanted to be more and more aware of how I move through the world. So. Schema Geometrica with Rainer Mir, Ria, Rilke, and a Tuk Tuk and a dog. I breathe indiscriminately, I kill the same, just as air does now, moving through me. Oxygen unstrung and grafted to blood, waste product, even now in these words, thinking, oh, tall tree in the ear, keep churning. 
You are such a beautiful kite carrying me elsewhere. I forget I am just another engine idling. I don't even worry sometimes the electricity I use keying my avatar through the ether or wondering if any of the molecules pouring out of me carried Rilke too to such levels of pop popularity and despair, such ecstasy. I am so outside myself right now, I must be tactile. First God again, always first gods again, or Fi in Kanpur, in Faridabad, where all of us live, in micrograms per cubic meter, in asthma, in scavenger cells, in emphysema. Oh, footprint, 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 rickshaw morphing into tuk-tuk. My exhalations must be in the neighbor's dog by now, and then out again moving east, because that's where all the wind is going, over and through the trees, carrying this dispersed liquid aerosol I am forever expressing toward you. Janet Colson wrote a poem about Levi's last night. I have a poem about Levi's. I went into I don't know why I got, I, went, I kept wanting to interact with the people who make my clothes, the people, the woman who sewed this button. I want to talk to her. I want to talk to her child. This is a poem that ends up on its knees in a pair of Levi's. There's only one place in America where Levi's are made. Every place else, China and, and uh, Mexico. So then I wanted to write a poem about my pants, which are hecho in Mexico. They have that provenance being works of art which is fine by me, I know a few words of Spanish. So I can mutter, gracias Juan y Maria, gracias, gracias Felipe, me llamo Dennis. Un, es un placer conocerte. Como se dice en español, distressed. Because the knees are so beautifully ragged, I must praise you. Though now, I think it is your own knees I must consider. Lo siento, mis amigos, your jobs are gone, the cuts, are being lasered now. Oh, Guadalajara, oh, San Juan del Rio. I am on my iPhone in a first world condo, sunlight baking my white skin raw, slim pointer finger so unlike a laser coming at you. It pokes letters and then does it again. The keyboard is so small, it keeps auto-correcting, killing my mood. Sidebar, perhaps I should consider an iPad that's bigger more lap friendly. Oh, China, your language may be broken sticks to me, but I can write them down beside the teeming gulf to say, ni hao, tu tambien haces Levi's. Ni hao, everyone. Laura did a brilliant job last night with poetry and healing and, and, and uh, Marcy and I were talking about the day and Marcy shared her poem to me and I wanted to read a poem kind of that deals with that. One of the things we, we talked about was that the word healing, I came to poetry out of trauma and the word healing is always like, it's like 50 years later and it's like the word healing, is, <laughs> it's still waiting, <laughs> waiting for the healing to occur. And in fact, 48 years after the event that I'm going to describe here, I got a, somebody sought me out, a high school friend sought me out on, on Facebook. He'd been in a terrible hot air balloon accident and he, he, he writes me and goes, I finally know what you went through after 48 years. Wow. This poem's called, called Disintegration Loop with Car Crash and a Knife and Some Flowers. This is my car crash womb, 1968, where I was born a second final time. Trauma, garden I keep walking through every spring or better. Some island beach, it is so desolate. Ambulance one, two boys dead, heads bashed in, bleeding everywhere, droplets and pooling blood. One boy alive on the engine cover, holding for balance. Ambulance two, the same, two girls dead, another howling, same pitch and timbre as parent, parent, burning down chorus. Oh, threshold in the dark now lit with fluorescence. How many alternative, alternate lives breeding them I could not follow. Sorrows so deep you had to bury them 
and then bury them again. No language for it. So you just polished the shock and played with a knife. It's keening a low voltage pulse indicating intelligence as if from another planet. That is, insert car crash, insert flowers everywhere. My numbering system is failing me. Oh, the mood change. This poem's called, What is the Wooly Bully and Will It Come Again? I still don't know what the Wooly Bully is. Does anybody know what the Wooly Bully is? I can't see any of you, so I don't know. If you know, tell me, I don't know what it is. I know, I know Sam the Sham. What is the Wooly Bully and Will It Come Again? I liked it better when it was all AM radio and there was wind in my face. Left hand steering, right hand punching chrome keys the size of gumdrops. So I could be this thing for some length of speed and pop song minutes and then another. Right turn, no left, so I had to improvise. It was somebody else's film, a DJ soundtrack. Questions ringing. What is in fact the perfect ratio, time, V, lightning? Did body really sing? Was feedback God? All I had was this five banded spectrum, feints and attitudes, a feel for road, engine and road, curves, dips that were spring loaded at certain speeds. Oh, perfectly contoured earbuds. Oh, field of hairs alive with playlist. Where is that neural network now? A body beside me, so it was communal, a testosterone rush. Musk, whole flags of it spreading out of the windows because it was summer and we were blasting open silkworm cities aflame with twilight, lanterning the straightaways. When I found this out, it really confused the hell of me. It was this Instagram model that you sent her, if you showed, uh, well, back up. Before the pandemic, Australia was on fire, right? Birds were falling out of the sky, koala bears were dying. It was off, it was, looked like the apocalypse, <laughs> before the apocalypse. Um, and then this Instagram model, I believe she's Australian. If you, if you showed her a receipt that you sent $10 to a rescue fund, she would send you a nude photo of herself. <laughs> Like, this confused me. I didn't know what to say. And then she went, she tried to get other Instagram models to do it as well. And then they, then they threw her off Instagram. But before that, she raised $700,000, which is good for her. Wow. Schema Geometrica was Instagram model Kaylin Ward and a Yangtze River paddlefish. Oh, Kaylin Ward, I am sending you $10. Please send one nude photo of yourself to the following address. Together, we can save the world, for you have nearly saved Australia with your hot pics, but not the paddlefish. It is extinct in China and the Yangtze. Oh, Kaylin, do I honor it by dishonoring you? You are so tiny in my hands, I have to scroll to get the full effect, which is eros sometimes and then sometimes not. Then same river, same flat screen of extinction, a narrow ridged, finless dolphin. Oh, dolphin, porpoise, whatever you are, wherever you are, I would grow fins and Captain Beefheart a path to you. If it would save you, I am so in love with how easily your body wears that Yangtze medium and this woman's brain, her burst of data in the same endless stream, because I know now they are the same. There's a really wonderful movie um, uh, with, about Glenn Campbell's uh, dealing with Alzheimer's. I don't know if people see that. I only see five people here. Um, I forget the name of it. It'll come to me in a minute. 
but it's really wonderful. He found out he had Alzheimer's and he decided to um, go on tour for two years. He was on tour playing songs because he always, he could play, he'd get angry. He couldn't see, know his wife, forget his daughter. And he'd get on stage and he could, he could rip off Galveston. Like, wow, it's just an amazing, amazing uh, movie. And in the middle of it, it's like, he plays Galveston and then he goes, let's play it again. And it's like, yeah, you get to play Galveston again. You're dying. You get that last song. So <clears throat> this poem's called Anasazi Love Song. It takes place in Chaco Canyon. Um, well, Oakland, then Chaco Canyon. It was Glenn Campbell. The epigraph is Galveston, oh Galveston, I'm so afraid of dying. A pristine city of the brain, water rising along the Texas coasts. When I am no longer sure enough for you to keep loving me, and I can't or won't. Now anger, licking clean its plates, a name forgotten, my wife, daughter, even the beloved dog who hunkered against my leg for warmth because she was hurt that time in California when I was young and Aaron was cooking and Sophie's feet were sore from all the hiking and so she was rubbing them hard, both hands, and we were drinking beers and letting the television run. That last place they lived in Oakland, I'm pretty sure, West Street, just down from Montgomery Bart. All this remembering, just me exiting right before your eyes, last train, last trick, a prestige. Oh, Galveston, dear Galveston, please grant me one last song to play until the Southwest is cathedral in my eyes again, and my wife can see too what I am dreaming. That day at Chaco, Pueblo Benito, when we leaned against the inner walls and let the tourists pass like some tech savvy tribe, tour bus idling, covered with dust and next world elsewhere until they were gone and we were still alive inside our bodies, these ruins and desert music and desert wind alone was our music. This is probably the truest poem in the book. What happened is this, I got old, I got sentimental, is the title, it's the first line too. What happened is this, I got old, I got sentimental. I fell in love with everything. Example, James Booker, the Bayou Maharaja, that was easy. Example, Jerry Lewis, that was hard. But it was spring and there was big noise in the yard and so I said yes, many times yes. Yes, to that cascade of notes, to vitalis slicked hair, manicured nails. I preferred the chandelier in the brain, but most days I was just a 60 watt bulb with face and eyes. If I got my hands on a dog when I was out for a walk, great. Or heard a red winged blackbird down by the river, they are suddenly just here. They weren't last year. Or maybe I just watched two or three minutes of a kid's first bicycle ride. Yeah, that's what love is. A tense, wobbly ride over busted concrete, helmet like a piece of outer space until you crash. Yeah, love crashes, but you get back up, tighten that strap, power down the sidewalk, streamers flying, legs churning that impossibly easy gear, twice the speed of the wheels, pedals, the color of popsicles. I'll just, uh, I'll finish with two more. Since I was work, working for an engineering firm and they, we built power plants and you start thinking about all the stuff that we store, all the data, we make content left and right and then it just goes into a, a, a storage somewhere that's plugged in. I was reading an article saying somewhere by the, pretty soon, like 25% of the power in this country will be devoted to data 
just storing data, all the junk the government collects on us, all our stuff we have in the iCloud. It's just so staggering to me. And then I thought, wow, that's okay. That's my tomb. That's my, that's my pyramid. My, 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 I'm a pharaoh. When I die, that's where heaven is. As long as there's a power plant to keep me alive, people can Google me and get that page of forever stamps that, that pop up. Um, so this is called Schema Geometrica with John Keats, Death Mask and a Pyramid and a Cat. I mentioned that I put a, a, a photo of my cat on Facebook. I've had a cat, but I've never put a photo of my cat on Facebook. That's, I will not join that particular social phenomenon. Oh, a waiting tomb of digital presence. Here's my face, uncanceled, like a forever stamp to mark the searchable parts of heaven. Here my deleted files for the dark. My avatar so embedded there in a hurricane of code and algorithms, not even Keanu Reeves could find me. Oh, Neo, it will happen soon. I will slip that first matrix mother into this other womb, a band of love and fame. There are so many photographs of me with palms, as if I were a pharaoh among the hundred thousand other kings and queens. Here are the hidden rooms of my obsessions and two or three photos, forgive me, of my cat. Here is Keats' death mask. Alive, I love them all. Dead, they will be the fortune the living spend to fund this stream. Raced data stacked like urns beneath the sun. Oh, capacity, will you be that sun? My permanently benign and useful presence my Osiris, my viscera engorged with surge in rapture. And then I'll, then I'll finish with this poem. The, the, the arc of the book was really interesting in the sense that I started with contagion, and contagion hit, and it didn't bother me at all. I didn't get paralyzed. It was just more virus I could write about. And then right before everything closed down, I was at the Jacksonville Zoo getting a backdoor tour of the zoo. I was feeding penguins, flamingos, uh, giraffes. I was watching jaguars be hand fed. It was just an amazing day. And it was all during that discussion of the exotic wet market, if you will, and the source of the coronavirus. And there I was, I thought, in, in an exotic wet market. These creatures have had their habitats destroyed. We need to take care of them. And then there I was getting just spit on all day long. I smelled like fish. I had you know, giraffe spit on me. And, and one of the, the magical things is I got to feed an elephant. You know, this tons of elephants and me. And the only thing I could do was to hold out a piece of apple in my hand and have the elephant come down with just the tips of his trunk and just take that from me and just graze my hands and then kind of steal a little bit of touch going back. It was an amazing moment. I was convinced that the elephant was having as much fun as I was. He, the elephant experienced ecstasy as well as I did. So this is about that moment. So it's called, called Schema Geometrica with a slice of apple and an elephant. And then um, epigraph from D.H. Lawrence poem called Elephant. White man, you are saluted, pay a few cents. Ah, Ganesh. You take the offering so easily from my hand. This is all I know of blindness. By intuition, your vast, shy heart. By touch, your trunk lipped fingers, really, mountain of blood. Not quite September 1995, New Delhi, the milk drinking miracle, but still capillarial in its action. The ephemeral flesh of an apple no bigger than my pinky, lifted by the 40,000 muscles of your trunk tossed to gullet, and then that pause we allow for gods until one of us begged another and the other obeyed. Oh, awe and wonder immensity, what is lifted here? Who is lifting? I stood inside the moment like a fence post with arm, not tusk extended, and saw the breach, which was just my hand again with some twelfth moon sweetness, Florida sunlight, a waterfall, my own body a waterfall of sense and taste, some intermolecular force defying gravity. The way the keeper had you rear your trunk to reveal where the tusk was snapped, 
not cut and poached to its hidden living root. By this, I knew you. By this, I knew myself. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Ryan. I think Lauren is taking over at this moment. Oh, Lauren, okay, I'll take it. It is I, another round of applause. Thanks. For, for Dennis and for Laura. Both incredible readings. Um, and also um, really wonderful to see your work as poet laureate, especially your, you know, I didn't even live oh, yeah, here with yeah, yeah. poet laureate. So it was incredible to see that. If people have questions, please put them in the Q&A. I can start off the Q&A as we're waiting for questions to come in. Um, I'm wondering for both of you, because the work of actually writing a poem is often so private at a desk or at a kitchen table with one's notebook. I'm wondering how your public roles as poet laureate or even as teachers of poetry, how does that inform your writing and vice versa or does it? I don't, um, I, I don't, I don't think it informs the writing at all. I kept, the writing was, I think what happened for me was I met so many amazing people. People came up to me um, uh, after readings and one, one young man in particular just wanted to be my friend and he's my boon companion now. And what happened was um, I had the group of people that fed what I needed to do. And I, I wrote, I didn't think I would write a lick during the two years and I wrote more than I had ever written, which, is, which was amazing to me. Partly because I had these people in my life that fed me so that I was able to um, um, live in many different worlds. During that same period when I was poet laureate, I, would, I taught a graduate workshop class at Western. So I'd go talk to PhD students during the night and come back and then I'd be in a fourth grade classroom. So I was able to, uh, and to run all those different lines and understand that poetry had all these different kinds of uses and that as poet laureate, I needed to have this, this sort of a protean persona where I could shift, be a shape shifter, if you will. That I had to be in you know, a graduate class one night talking language theory and then hanging out with fourth graders. Right, or hanging out with 16 year old young women who are just you know, need, need attention of some kind and, and a sense that they, their lives have value. Um, so it was, I was well fed um, on the poetry end of the spectrum and it didn't, didn't uh, it actually energized me in ways that I was astounded by. Um, so, yeah. So, so I might answer that a little bit differently. Um, and uh, I was going to jump in before Dennis to say that I felt like Dennis sort of led me astray. He was talking about how he'd never done so much writing in his life. And um, that was not my experience. Of course, my experience was very different because of the pandemic. But um, what, what I found was that it really sort of grew a different side of my poet identity. So um, so like you were saying, Lauren, for me, po the poetry that I write, I've never written a decent poem ever in my life in a workshop. Um, it just doesn't work for me. I take the ideas from a workshop and go back and that's when it can turn into something. But um, sort of the, the part of me that is a public performing piece is very different than the part that writes. So I think, you know, I think that means that there's a lot of space in the role um, to for for people who function in different ways. Um, I just wouldn't say that the things that I was doing, I, I've never responded to my own prompt ever. Dennis last night read a poem that he had written in response to his own pr prompt. I'm like, oh wow, I would really love to be able to do that, but actually I never have. So. So I think um, it's a great it's a great question, and I think there's so much space for um, how the the role and um, the the different aspects of it get performed. 
I really appreciate that. And the, the very different experiences and responses and, and the room that, that the, low, the role allows for. There is now a question in the chat, so or in the question and answer space from Mimi Gonzalez Barrias. Does the new responsibility of poet laureates include instruction? Sharing poetry only makes more of it. I've learned so much from LPC and I'm so grateful. Thank you for the continuing sense of connection, even through Zoom. So I guess the, the question part of the comment is, does the responsibility include instruction? Um, but that might be a question more for Rulaine. I would, you know, I would think you're going to do workshops. If you want to reach out to people, you're going to um, uh, put together a plan and, and go out and do and write with people and um, in some way, shape, or form, and begin to help them see how to um, think about poetry. Poetry is a process. Part of the the instruction has to do with what's your process. You can fine tune a process. You can change the process. Changing the process results in different kinds of things and get them comfortable with the messiness of writing poetry. Um, and then teach them something about the, their formal imagination. I think that's one thing that I, I in the local scene, people do really wonderful way, put, write really wonderful poems at, at capturing emotion and capturing scene in place, but they're, and they're incandescent. Um, but poetry also is a practice on another level and there's poems, really good poems are laser. And there's a formal imagination that helps make the leap from that incandescence to the lasers to this the kind of cool level of instruction that, that goes on there and can change the way people look at poetry and think about poetry and think about their own work and get better at it. I think in answering the question about the, the responsibilities of the poet laureate, uh, formally the poet laureate needs to um, give at least four workshops. Uh, and one in each of the three counties uh, and then and also so there's a minimum requirement of four workshops and four readings but each of our poet laureates has done vastly more than that the other part of the re requirement is that the poet laureate um, do a special uh, project a uh, special poetry project that leaves a tangible um, footprint, a tangible, um, you know, it can be a product, it can be a program, it can be, um, you know, something like the Sidewalk Poetry Project or Laura's, um, you know, video, uh, the video project with uh, a lot of different community uh, poets. Uh, so there's a lot of space in those projects uh, for the poet laureate to design a project that's really exciting to her or him. Are there other questions or am I going to ask all the questions? Well, I, could ask, I could ask one. I could ask one. What, what did you find is the most challenging part of the Poet Laureate Project. I think when I first um, uh, was involved with Dream to the Lansing Poet Laureate Project, it seemed like the perfect job that there was only upside. And I've, I've since come to realize it's a lot of work, it's a lot of responsibility. Uh, what do you think was the most challenging part? So maybe I can jump in there because it sort of connects to something that Dennis said, which is um, that if it's it's really hard to keep your own agenda going because there are so many requests and there are so many things that people are ready for you to do and excited for you to do. And so to keep your own agenda means maybe saying no to those things, which feels contrary to the role. So like Dennis, I was all about yes, but it meant I was putting in so many hours doing the yes, that it becomes really hard to then have the extra time, the extra energy to actually pursue sort of the long term thing that you have set out to do. But it's a, it's a good problem to have, right? 
I mean, it's, it's great to have people who want you to come and do programs and readings and, to, and workshops and to organize things. Um, it's, a, it's a grand problem to have, but it, is, it does make that other part hard, I think. For me, it did. Sort of too much of a good thing. It's too much. I, at, at some point, I think I, I said, I wish there were, I think in a, an interview that was, I don't know, in uh, City Pulse or somewhere, I said, I wish there were four of me to do this. Mm -hmm. What about you, Dennis? What did you find the most challenging thing? Um, you know, I was first, so just the, the negotiating the idea of how much time to spend on it and then dealing with the request, as Laura said, uh, I didn't, I didn't want to say no to anyone. I think I said no once, but it was because I was going to be out of town and anyone who called me and wanted me, I said, yes. Um, but I had the luxury of, of being retired at the time. So I had plenty of time to do that. So I wasn't holding down another job, et cetera. And I was the first and um, I felt great pressure to hit home runs <laughs> every quarter because it was the first. And that was okay. I, I took that on willingly, happily, because I believed in it. And, and Bob Trezides' vision for Lansing was energetic, energizing as well. Because he's, you know, just, he loves this place. He loves making this place better. And I took that energy on and, and then it was easy. And then again, um, I met so many, I got outside the, the poetry community and met new people. And you find really smart, intelligent, creative people that get you to think across, across disciplines and that, that come up with ideas and that just, that, that just would, was exciting to me and just fed me, fed, you know, fed my work and gave me energy so that uh, I only got burned out twice <laughs> during the two year period and had to go uh, get, get uh, to intervene on myself and take myself out of it for a while. Um, but it, um, you know, I don't, you know, I, when I made the choice, I, I wasn't going to do it. And then when I made the choice to apply, I decided if I got it, I was in 100%. I wasn't going to say any, you know, I wasn't going to quibble about any of it. I was just going to go for it and then, and then buy into it and just have fun. I'd done a lot of the stuff before. I built a new persona for it. I was online a lot more than I like to be online. I was putting my face out there more than I like to put my face out there, but I thought that was part of the job to be the, the ambassador to the poetry. I, you know, became a different, engaged in different parts of my personality that, you know, I don't, I don't have to use them anymore in order to do the job well. And sometimes that was a little difficult, but it was fun. You know, you get asked to, I like the challenges, write an inaugural poem, you know, go speak to the Rotary Club and maintain their attention so they don't pull their phones out and play with their phones while you're speaking during the whole time. And that was like, yeah, I found out I could do that. I went and spoke to the Rotary Club. She goes, that's the first time nobody got their phone out. They listened to you. Okay, cool. You know, that was fun, challenging, um, but it was all fun, so. Both these questions and answers sort of illustrate the differences between your both of your experiences as poet laureate, both being retired or not retired or during COVID, pre-COVID, yeah. um, which again points to sort of the expansiveness of the possibilities for mm -hmm. the role. There's one similarity I noticed. Um, Laura, today you said something I think this was referring to poetry during COVID. We needed poetry to pay attention as poet. We needed as poetry pays attention. As we said, we needed poetry to pay attention as poetry pays attention. And it struck me because I had read an article where Dennis said something very similar and it was pre-pandemic. Um, you said something about poetry as a way to stay alert mm -hmm. and stay aware of the world. Mm -hmm you live in as, as part of a reason to practice poetry. I was wondering if you could both speak to that, the role of poetry and being aware, alert, paying attention, significance. I just, for, for me, it is, uh, it's, it's the meditation. I don't know how I could live in the world without paying attention and parsing these, you know, the things that I write about. I know I'm connected to all things. You know, part of it is I know we don't know anything. <laughs> 
and we're, we're, we're constantly in a, I feel like it's interesting to be in a perpetual epistemological ontological crisis. I don't know who I am, I sh things change. Um, um, I don't know how I know what I know. I live in such a limited spectrum of senses, right? Uh, and the world is much richer than that. So it's a way for me to pay attention to all that and practice a kind of, it's a spiritual, I think, practice for me. And it comes out of just the sheer joy of writing and being able to you know, go back to that Whitman thing, connect to those things. So I don't know how, I can't imagine my life. I've done it for so long, I can't imagine not ever writing and being aware of things and being alert and looking for things to write about and seeing how this thing here connects with that thing there and putting something together that you know, is interesting. I just, I can't, I love that part of it. I love figuring out how to, you know, you can get, you can get into ruts. You can start sounding like yourself and then imitating yourself. And after a while, you're really not seeing anything new because you're writing the same darn thing again and again and again. So I always like learn the rules, break the rules break yourself, if you will, change something about how you go about it or how you're shaping the poem on the page in order to see something new. Make discoveries that way. That's where the, the, the pleasure in it is. So. I'll end there. So, so my response to that would be a little bit different because of course I'm bringing it back to um, this time that we're in this pandemic and of course, um, part of uh, what I felt a little apologetic about my poems for, I would never read all of those poems in the same reading because they have so many of the, I'm paying attention to so many of the same things because so much of, I feel like what has happened during the pandemic really is this sort of um, slow down version of our lives, at least at the start where in fact we did pay a lot of attention whether it was a lot of attention to things that we were afraid of so that that thing about remember when we all washed our groceries and kept them outside um, before we brought them in the house and the guy on um, youtube who showed us how to have the sanitized part of our counter and the unsanitized part of our counter we bring stuff in and then we can do this right so um, that's a certain kind of paying attention but I think it also was that we sort of came face to face with things that really terrified us and that we didn't understand and that, um, you know, sort of um, imagining outcomes for people we loved and for people, for, for the people we were and how our lives were upended and how this could happen in such a short amount of time. All of that, I think, sort of pulled us up short and really did um, in the same way that in a car accident, you see it over and over in slow motion. You know, we sort of did have this attentiveness that perhaps was not part of our regular ways of doing things before that. And, and so that for me was part of the paying attention, even when it was always the same kittens and the same puppy and the same, you know, all, all of those things that just kept happening over and over. How many times can you watch the puppy do something and be enamored of it, right? But, you know, that's it. I really appreciate that response. I feel like I had a, a similar solitary experience of the pandemic of just staring at the same walls for, <laughs> for months and months and months, so. I know what you're referring to. It's very John Cage though, right? So and, and I, think, for... I, I think Lauren, you said you have cats, right? So you even yeah. have a part of it. Like you study your the pets around you as if they're very, very interesting because they are. Mm -hmm. Or become obsessively worried if they, you know, throw up or so, like things that I wouldn't even have been aware of because I wouldn't have been there. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> are there other, are there any other questions, or should I give it back to Lori? Let's say last call for questions from the audience. Well, thank you both. I really appreciate the thoughtful answers, and I'm going to hand it over to my wonderful colleague Lori Hollinger here. Well, thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Dennis, Laura, 
what what a magical evening here. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, Rulane. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Leap. Um, and I want to also remind you again, um, if you scroll up in the chat, you will see that link to the uh, Lansing Poet Laureate application. It was quite early in the event. Um, anyhow, um, or you can also find information about that and several other things by uh, following the Lansing Poetry Club on Facebook. You can subscribe to our e-newsletter or follow us on social media at Center for Poetry. And um, one of the things you would know if you're subscribing is that this coming Sunday, the Lansing Poetry Club is sponsoring Burning Like Lamps on the Ocean from 1 to 3 p.m. at Urban Beat in Old Town. It's an open mic at which you are encouraged to read a poem about someone departed. I believe that's the idea. Is that correct? It could be, it could be a poem. You're, encouraged, you're invited to read a poem by a favorite dead poet or a poem in honor of or about a beloved family or friend member who has passed on. So it's it's a a reading to honor our beloveds uh, who have lit the path before us. Thank you, Rulain. And then um, our next event will be a celebration of the Benvenuto High School Poetry Contest and the Tom Samet Fiction High School Fiction Contest. Uh, we'll present a video of the winners reading their winning entries. That will be this coming uh, week from tonight, 7 p.m., right here on Zoom. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here and for your continued support of all of our programming around town. And I wish you all good health and a good evening. Take good care. Thank you so much, Lauren and Lori, Dennis and Laura. Beautiful evening. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>